the way, I know one is for sure, Trustee Abraham and uh, Trustee Chell Malavi. Um, so right now, uh, we obviously no roll call because they're not here. Can we stand have a Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, if we have a moment of silence and reflection, please. Okay, uh, we're gonna get down any public comments. I see none, that's a good thing. Okay, uh, no public comments. Uh, Mayor Katrina Thompson, uh, you've got some something you'd like to say? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Good evening. Finance Committee Chairman, Trustee Terry. We'd like to say we got two presentations tonight and because we are in the finance com uh, committee meeting, I thought it was advantageous just to combine the two. The uh, assessor is running a little bit behind schedule. We had him keyed up to be the first speaker as it relates to our property taxes. So we're gonna reverse it and bring up Stifo Financing to talk about pension management. And the reason why we entertain in this discussion because I think it's something that we all need to be educated on as we talk about the pension crisis that we have in our state. Most certainly it impacts the village of Broadview as we look at pensions for fire and police, and it can be burdensome to us how we look at capital projects as it relates to getting streets repair or capital improvements that we need. And this is not something that the board has decided to do, but it's an option for us to look at and to heavily consider us looking into this, this part of the process. And so when, uh, Mr. Reedy brought the concept to myself and the finance team. We was like, well, this is an option for us to get rid of that burdensome and to be able to do more for our own community if we can get some relief somewhere. So this is the first step is just introducing the concept to the community, not saying that we're gonna buy into it or we're gonna do it, but we wanna keep it a very transparent dialogue amongst the residents that's gotta look at this type of bonding issue. And it's a lot to wrap your mind around we're still learning about it, but most certainly we want the dialogue to start. So if it ever comes up, we've already started the process and we can start getting like some of the concerns or the questions that may come up from a resident where the finance team could you know, analyze and look at the numbers and crunch some numbers for us, get the trustees to look at the concept, get their buy-in if they can you know, see something, but it takes all of us. So I'm gonna give you an example of what I mean by that. So when we had looked at uh, a couple of years ago at, when we raised our water rates increase, we held several community meetings regarding that because we wanted you all to have a buy-in. We wanted to get your questions and your concerns answered. And that's our platform to be accountable and transparent to the community that we serve in. It's the same concept. So we may have to have multiple meetings around this concept, but it's something for us to look at something to, for us to probably entertain, but we don't have all the answers tonight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom and Stifle to take the lead on the presentation. And if we have questions, we can get the questions answered, but we want it to be a dialogue between the leadership that I lead with and the residents that's gotta look at this. And just always remember, I live here too. Okay, so it impacts all of us, but I think it's a good thing. We will leave um, some extra books here and then you can provide this electronically um, to the mayor, to the village, um, so that folks are, are able to see this uh, information for themselves. <clears throat> I didn't know, I didn't have a key up for here. Uh, so we can just go through this if you'd like, or I, I could plug in my computer. Um, I hate to keep people, it'll probably take me five minutes just to get the computer started and keyed up, so. I think we could just jump right in. So um, 
it looks like most folks who wanted one were able to get a copy of this. Uh, I'll get one eventually. So uh, again, thank you, Mayor, for the introduction. My name is Tom Reedy with Steeple Financial. Uh, this is my colleague, Jeremy Knudsen. Um, he and I are both based here in Steeple Chicago office. Our, our specialty is uh, municipal bonds. I think that's important to point out right at the beginning here um, is that we're not talking about pension investing or making any re recommendations for changing how um, funds are currently invested by the villages through public safety pension plans. Um, Um, but we are here to talk about um, the, the village's um, pension funding situation in general, and then um, the potential issuance of bonds to help um, fund the village's pensions up to 100% um, funded, as opposed to the current situation there now. So um, just, we'll start here on slide four, um, talking about the need um, for um, some pension management techniques for the village. Um, we can, uh, We'll go into it a little bit more in detail as we move through the presentation, but suffice it to say that contributions to the village's public safety pension plans, the police and fire um, plans are making a significant dent in the village's annual budget. Um, it's been growing over time um, and it's, it's um, becoming more and more of a struggle um, for villages across the state of Illinois um, to manage that increase in costs on an annual basis. Um, the rating agencies are taking an increasingly negative view on the statute, which the statute states that um, villages must get or bring their pension funds up to 90% funded um, by 2040. So uh, that's what the statute requires. Um, that's, that's received some negative uh, feedback from the rating agencies. Most recently, um, in July of 2020, S&P stated that funding targets of less than 100% are considered a credit weakness, um, as these plans carry higher costs associated with the unfunded liabilities. Um, and then in a, in a recent credit report specifically on the Village of Broadview, S&P stated that in our opinion, a credit weakness is Broadview's large pension and OPEP obligation without a plan in place um, that we think will sufficiently address the obligation. Um, so this is a very much a focus of the rating agencies. Um, and for those of us who are in the municipal bond world, um, higher ratings equate to lower borrowing costs, lower interest costs, which means lower taxes or, or lower overall costs for financing capital projects. Um, and as S&P is um, downgrading some communities who are grappling with these pension costs, um, that's just serving to increase the interest rates paid for uh, capital projects. <clears throat> Lastly, pensions are, unfunded pension liabilities are a form of compounding debt. Um, and the reason for that is the longer that the debt is outstanding, um, the more interest uh, the village must pay. Um, there are three sources of funding for pensions, uh, one being employer contributions, two being employee contributions, and the third source of uh, growth in pension funds or funding pensions is investment returns. So every dollar that's not in the fund earning investment returns is uh, a dollar that the village will have to make up over time. <coughs> um, so flipping over, <coughs> excuse me, flipping over to slide five here, um, we have a breakdown of the last five years of the village Broadview's uh, pension contribution requirements. Uh, these were all calculated by an independent actuary that the village hired um, to evaluate its pension funds every year, and then they're reported in the village's financial statements. Um, you can see here the total employer cost, kind of in this middle column here, has risen over the last five years by $973,000. Um, and as you can imagine, that's a lot for any municipality to stomach in terms of increased contributions. Um, that is an increase of 33% um, over the last five years. But if you look just to the left of that, um, there's a breakdown of normal cost and total UAL contribution. Um, UAL standing for unfunded accrued actuarial liability. 
Um, the normal cost is a cost associated with benefits that are accruing in the current year. Um, so that's a cost that's going to be there for any uh, municipality who offers a pension benefit to its employees. Um, the second column here, the total UAL contribution, is the contribution for making catch-up payments, so to speak, uh, meaning the unfunded liability um, that is on the, uh, the village's books right now has to be funded over time by 2040, <coughs> according to current statute. Uh, and you can see that that has risen um, $844,000 over the last five years. So of the total increase, that, that has um, constituted the lion's share of that increase. Uh, moving to slide six here, um, as those those payments have been increasing significantly over the five years, um, we've got a five-year look back of the total liability for police and fire pensions of the village. Um, you can see here um, to the right-hand side, the total liability has increased over time. You would expect the liability to increase as, as pension benefits continue to accrue um, for the village's public safety employees. Um, but to the left hand side, uh, and that, that liability has grown by, excuse me, 12 million, um, 12.4 million over the last five years. Um, to the left hand side, you can see that the assets held in those pension funds have grown by just about 5.9 million over a similar time frame. Um, and the UAL for the village has grown by um, six and a half million. So as those contributions, continue to ratchet up, um, the, the unfunded portion of liability has continued to grow um, to the point where the funded ratio has, has pretty much stayed flat um, over the past five years. Um, so that's kind of a five-year historical look back and, and some comments about um, the situation that the village is currently facing. Um, again, not an uncommon situation across the state. It's uh, it's being faced by many, many communities, including the state itself. Um, the state tends to get more press as it's uh, a much bigger entity, of course, but um, we know that on the public safety side, this is a challenge for um, all communities across the state. So um, with that, I'll hand it off to Jeremy. He'll talk a little bit about um, the strategy um, and any questions as well. Real, real quick, Mr. Reedy. So based on slide six, this last column, unfunded ratio, you're saying that's the column that needs to be at 10 percent or less by year 2024. That's correct. Okay. Per current statute, um, 90 percent by 2040 is the requirement, and that's why we're saying 90 percent funded. 90 percent funded by 2040. So this this final column, the unfunded ratio, can't be greater than 10 percent. Exactly. Um, and as that's that statute came into effect uh, or was passed in 2011. Um, so as we get closer and closer to that 2040 deadline, um, that's why we're expecting the payments to continue to rise. Right. Thank you. Tom, quick question. Can you tell us uh, where we are with our pension? Currently, we have funded. So the, the current, the most recent actuarial valuations are between police and fire combined are at 54.6% um, with an unfunded liability of approximately 43 And uh, again, nice to speak with you all this evening. Again, my name is Jeremy Newton. Yeah, can you use the mic? Thank you. My name is Jeremy Newton, and it's a, a real pleasure to be able to speak with you. Um, as Tom had said, you know, currently that fund ratio sits at right around 54%. That was as of the last um, actuarial valuation in 2020. So we would expect. Thank you. We would expect that after the investment returns that occurred over the last year that the funding situation should be better but i do think it's important to recognize you know looking over the past five years as the village has contributed more and more you've really ended up kind of treading water from an overall funding perspective again that's very common around the state of illinois but it's really one of the reasons we're here uh, recognizing the strain that that puts on the budget every year to see those payments going up while still not making a lot of ground toward that 90% funded ratio uh, that you have to get to by statute uh, in 2040. 
So our concept for a potential idea to help with that is what we introduce on page eight, pension funding bonds or pension obligation bonds. The concept just at a very high level, um, we kind of think of as akin to refinancing a mortgage. You have your, your pension debt that accrues um, typically at a, a rate in the high 6% or 7%. And you can replace that with bond payments to investors in the current market at much, much lower rates. In this case, for the village, uh, around 2.27%. So again, very high level. That's kind of where the potential benefit can come from, replacing a very expensive liability with a lower cost liability. Uh, and we'll get into some of the nuances with that. But I do think it's, again, important to point out we're not here to, to tell you to change how you're investing your money. You have professionals at the pension fund that, that does that. Um, and, and that's their kind of purview. They, you know, uh, all of these kind of assumptions are built on the fact that they'll continue to invest as they, uh, as they see fit. Um, and, you know, like, like anything, the, the risk of a, a future, uh, return falling, you know, short of what's expected or exceeding what's expected uh, would continue to exist whether or not you pursue this concept. So I think that's kind of important to keep in mind. Uh, we turn to page nine, a uh, little bit of background on this topic. Um, pension bonds are not a new idea. They've been issued going back to the 1980s. Um, but one of the reasons kind of we're here talking about it today is uh, core interest rates are very, very low compared to historical levels. Uh, that's in part due to uh, the recent pandemic where the, the interest rates have really fallen. Uh, but another reason we're talking about this now is back in the 80s, there was no statute in place saying that you had to be at a certain funding level by a certain date. So it was very, very common for municipalities all over the state, really all over the country, to you know, make payments that were lower than required or take a couple of years off from making those payments and, and do other things. It's really only been, as Tom said, in the past five, 10 years that that statute has really kicked into place and required communities to make those higher and higher payments every year. So that's really what's driving uh, the interest in this concept. If we turn to slide 10, we can get into what the numbers actually look like uh, for the village in the current market. Uh, we're talking about a potential kind of total unfunded liability, so money that's owed to the system of just over $40 million. That's for the combined police and fire pensions. Uh, again, that's to, if you were to get up to full 100% funding, you would need that, you know, 40.9 uh, million dollars to go into the pension systems. If you were to do that, kind of on day one, sell a pension bond, deposit that money into the pension system, you're 100% funded at that point. So you will have uh, met and exceeded the statutory requirement. In exchange for making that payment to the fund, you would then owe bond payments to investors at that lower market rate of about 2.27% where the fund would then be able to invest those proceeds and earn what it assumes is a, again, six and a half or 7% return. And that's where you see in the graph, the red line that's at the top of the graph here, that's the current projection. So that's what your actuary is calculating and saying where things stand today. If we make our payments as scheduled over time, they are gonna escalate by approximately $3 million uh, between now and 2040. Um, if we look at the gray line that's below that, you can see a, a much, uh, much more level um, line there. And that's the, the replacement with bond payments rather than making the, the payments into the fund. Uh, and that's where you see the potential benefit over time in the, the green bars. I know there's a lot going on on the page. Um, and I know we're throwing a lot of terms and data at you. So again, please feel free to interrupt with questions, uh, but we'll um, kind of break these down with specifics on the following page, um, if there are no questions at this point. 
So on page 11, we just have kind of the numbers that are behind that graph. And so what I think is helpful, I can kind of try to walk through what, you know, what we're talking about here and um, what some of the potential benefits might be. One of the things that Tom had mentioned earlier is every single year, there's a normal cost component to the payment. That number is due every single year, regardless of the, even if you're hundred percent funded, you still have to continue to make your normal cost payment to the system. So that's the dark blue column that you see, uh, column A. You'll notice that appears in both existing situation and over to the right in the pension bond situation. You always have to make your normal cost. You'll also notice that that number, while it does increase over time, it increases by a pretty moderate uh, level of growth, usually around 3% a year. Um, and, and again, that's very common uh, across all pension systems. Column B feeds into what's ultimately that red line that was on the prior graph, which we see in the red column here. That's where you see the real impact of the unfunded issue and what that means over time, increasing from right around $4 million today, projected to go all the way up to 7 million by 2040. Um, that's where really that budgetary pain comes from in having those steep increases to get from right around 54% today to 90% or in this case, 100% by 2040. If we compare that to the right-hand side of the table, again, normal cost, exact same numbers, but let's look at the, the yellow column, pension bond debt service. Those would be the payments that you would owe to investors if you did this deal. Um, what you can see there is those numbers stay the same over time, about two and a half million dollars. That number fluctuates very slightly, but it doesn't really increase over time. That's where I think the real power of this concept comes from. It's being able to lock in those payments to investors rather than face that steep red line increase year over year. So if you compare ultimately the column on the far right estimated savings, that's where you see the potential benefit of that coming in. Um, the, you know, you continue to make your normal cost payments you make payments to bondholders for that $40 million. The pension fund is 100% funded over time and makes its investment returns and all the other assumptions that the actuary puts out there. And that's where you see the estimated savings come in, which totals uh, just a, under $25 million on the present value basis. Um, so, it, you know, very, very sizable potential savings there. Again, um, this is not a, a silver bullet. There are any number of kind of assumptions that are built into this. We do have some concepts that we think can help mitigate those risks, but uh, we would echo the, the mayor's comments at the beginning that this is, you know, these are all big numbers. These are big problems. They didn't happen overnight and we wouldn't pretend that you can solve it in, in one fell swoop. Um, so we encourage the discussion, uh, happy to answer questions. We've got additional stuff in the book here, but I think maybe it's a good place to pause and see if there are questions at this point. And I just want to make sure that, that I'm understanding what you're saying here. So, so basically, the areas of these yearly bar graphs that are in green is, is the amount that, of the potential savings. So this is money that we will then not have to pay out each of the years, and it will be available to use for other things in the village, such as fixing streets, water mains, et cetera. So instead of every year our pension eating up more of our tax base, the pension will be, be set and we will have more funds to do the things that the village needs to have done. Is that a good summary? That's a good summary. Um, and of course, every single year, you know, the pension fund is investing that money and the assumption is 7%, as we all know, it's the only thing we know for sure is it's never going to be exactly 7% in a given year. So every year that gets recalculated, but yes, kind of at baseline, that's the, uh, that's the concept. Do I have time? Uh, you know, I do have another one. Let me yeah. find it real quick here. 
Okay. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you this question because if someone asked me this question, I don't know how I would answer it. So you, you, you've went back five years. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be in the budget officer position for 12 years. And this was a problem in 2010. And for those of you that, that are unfamiliar with the pensions, each year we have an uh, actuarial report done. And the result of that is they give us three numbers. They give us the statutory contribution, they give us the contribution to, to 90, and then they give us what they think we should do to, to, to actually get there. Starting 12 years ago, we've used, it, 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 each one is higher. We have funded the pensions at the highest actuarial number each year. But as this il illustration shows, from 2016 to 2020, even though we're funding at that high rate, our total funded pension pen, portion of the pension is actually decreased by 1.1%. What other factors are driving that? Is that investment returns? Is that the salaries of the existing? What, I, I, just, I don't know what would, what would be driving it. Yeah, that's a, a very astute observation. And again, it's, it's really not common. We, uh, or I should say, it's something we see in a lot of systems um, that are kind of in this same um, approximate level of funding where you have a lot of catching up to do. Um, Part of it is how the actuaries calculate what those payments need to be over time, uh, where it, it's calculated as a percentage of payroll that it's built to kind of escalate over time. But really, I think, you know, some of it is investment performance where, you know, that fluctuates some years better than others. One big driver, I think, is um, people are living longer. Great, great thing for society, not so great for pension math because every so often the actuaries kind of recalculate what, what they call mortality tables. And when they show that people are living longer, that's longer that benefits have to be paid. And whenever that happens, when they introduce that into their calculations, you always see those numbers kind of go up. It just kind of makes the, um, it, it provides more that you have to kind of catch up to. So I think that's probably driving it as well. Some of those assumptions that are changing. I think that another thing that uh, you have to take into consideration is the, the workforce itself. So as the retirees retire out at a higher uh, salary, you're replacing those with lower level employees that their contribution isn't as much as the individual that retired. And then the size of the, you know, the, the fire department 10 years ago isn't the same size as it is today. So you had more individuals 10 years ago paying into the system than you do today. So all of those dynamics mm -hmm. play into it. That's a, a good point. And, you know, it's also, I think, an important thing to recognize here. All these numbers are kind of the village's responsibility. You really don't have a lot of say over the, the employee contributions or benefits for that matter. And, and so, um, it really does fall largely on the village to kind of make up the difference when you have those uh, changes in the workforce over time. Any other questions or comments? Tim, Tom? I had a couple. Uh, recently, the state went to a three-tier system for employees in the fire service. I don't know if it affected the police departments or not. Uh, so there's a three-tier uh, three tier system. Uh, Anthony Monks here. He is with the uh, pension fund. He might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's three tiers now, right? Uh, currently, at two. currently two, but going to three. Tier two. Okay. Uh, with this, uh, state okay. You guys are aware of that. Okay. How is that going to affect it? I also have uh, pension funds have been combined or going to be combined. State came in and said, Robbie, fire department, you could no longer make your own investments. We're going to take over. How is that going to affect this as now we're going into a bigger pool for investments? Uh, so how is that going to affect it as well? Sure. So uh, two questions there. The first uh, regarding tier two or the revised tier two, um, we don't anticipate that to have an impact on the unfunded liability. Okay. And the reason for that is as you hire new employees, tier two employees, that's 
those employees are coming in with no benefits accrued already. So the unfunded liability that we're talking about addressing is really for benefits that have all been accrued in the past and they're the responsibility of the village to make up for now. Um, so those tier two benefits will have an impact on the normal costs that we've, we've uh, referenced a couple times. Those are the blue bars at the bottom. Um, the normal cost will change, will be different with once the, the department, both on the police and the fire side are all tier two employees versus if they were all tier one employees. Um, so it does have an impact on the overall pension contributions on an annual basis, but it does not have any impact on the unfunded portion of the liability. Okay. And that's um, all we're talking about. Okay. And then secondly, on the consolidation, um, the way that consolidation will work is that um, the state will have two consolidated funds, as you know, for police and fire, and each of those funds will still continue to track assets and liabilities and unfunded liabilities on a community by community basis. So um, if some, if one fund's coming in at 80% funded and another fund's coming in at 50% funded, they're not averaging out to where both funds end up. Right, I, I get that, but um, you have a bigger pool. So obviously if you put more pennies in the jar, it's gonna get bigger. So we, we um, the reason, the motivation behind consolidation was to realize some um, efficiencies with regard to investments. Um, and I think that the expectation is that um, the fund as a whole, uh, or the two funds as a whole on a statewide basis will realize some efficiencies in terms of um, fees over time. And also being a larger fund will have less restrictions on the um, assets that can right. be invested in. Right. Um, so there will be, um, the expectation is, is that the larger fund will, will have slightly greater um, investment performance over time. And again, we can't predict what that's going to be. Um, I can, we can point to IMRF as an example. IMRF already functions very much like what I just described the two consolidated funds will, fu will function like. Um, and they, they assume 7.25% return in their fund. Um, whereas um, most of the smaller funds that we work with, um, with local communities are um, below 7% at this time. Um, that's because the smaller the fund year is, the smaller um, amount of money you have to invest the more restrictions in the statute on what can be invested in. So we, we expect some economies of scale, if you will, um, from the consolidated funds. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else have any more? Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for having us. <laughs> Thanks for coming out, appreciate it. Okay, next up, uh, we've got uh, Pension management financing. I'm sorry that we switched you guys. The assessor. Walk out there so we can see the presentation. He's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was some information about the pension management, something for us to just take under consideration. I know this is going to be an ongoing conversation, but I rely heavily on the experts because I'm most certainly I'm, I'm not a financial person, but we do have a sharp finance department with Tim Hicks being the director and Tom Hood being our budget officer. I know they'll make good sound decisions on behalf of the bro of the village of Broadview will make a recommendation to us at the board level. So now I want to introduce our assessor, Fritz Kage, as we talk about property taxes. So we know that we got some situations with the property tax. So we in, we had a meeting with the mayors, um, with with the uh, with uh, assessor Kage, and we had a discussion. And so he had and was willing to come to talk to our community about how it impacted the village of Broadview. And so I've had several discussions with many of our residents, and I just want to just say, can we just give our clerk a round of applause? Because when this issue, when we first got our tax bills and we having these discussions, and I'm not a strong believer in pointing the fingers at any one entity, I just like to get to the solution and how it can help me be efficient to articulate that information back to you all. And so I had a conversation with the clerk. He stepped up to the plate. We have actually served 12 seniors to get their tax exemptions. 
Oh, 15. Oh. Thank you. To, to, you know, help escalate their um, non-exemptions that they had not been taken. So we got 15 residents that have been processed like, a, I guess, on an emergency basis. I don't know what they call it, but expedited. expedited. Thank you. To uh, make sure that the exemptions are taken before the October 1st tax bill is um, come out. But it's a process. And so, you know, some residents said, well, how come only the seniors are we looking at the seniors? Well, we have to take baby steps to come up with the solutions to the issue. And that was the first step is to help them because many of them have paid off their homes and we don't want their homes to go to a tax sale when something we could have did as simple as just assisted. And so that's the next step. And so the next step for us is to have these types of conversations, which sometimes are hard conversations and they don't feel good when we're talking about it because we're talking about spending more money. But I like to use me as an example all the time. So when I look, if you go to the, um, the treasurer's office and you look up your PIN number and they give you a 20 year data of overall taxes over a 20 year period of time, my taxes went up 138%. That sounds like a lot, right? But when I looked at it and, and I looked at the dollar amount, it was $3,500 over the period of time that my taxes went up. And when I divided that by that amount of time, it was only like $14 a year that it went up. So you have to really just like break it down into layman terms that we can understand. And when I had a conversation, I see one of the taxpayers in the room that we've had dialogue about it and broke it down to her like that, it made sense. But when we start talking about like a big impact like we got in this last bill, it's a sticker shock. And so we want answers on how we can resolve that. So as many, it's different tiers to all of this. So you got the assessor's office, you got the board of review, you got our large businesses filing tax appeals. We got businesses that take advantage of the Cook County uh, incentives that's provided, which I think sometimes that could be double dipping if you get a tax, if you get a tax break, how come you can get a tax incentive? So it's a lot of moving pieces to this. And I don't like to point the fingers at any entity. I like to get to the solution of the problem on how we could be proactive in our advocacy on holding elected officials accountable. Because I'm held accountable, I'm holding all of them accountable as well. And we all as residents have to do the same thing. But we demand the answers and we want to know why. So Assessor Kagi agreed to bring his team to talk to us about our property taxes so that we get a better understanding. If you have questions, ask them. But let's get to a solution and not point the fingers how we can help. We got to pay the tax bill, but we need to understand why it is the way that it is as well. So, Assessor, thank you for being here. I want you fixing the slide. I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. Um, will, will people who are watching be able to see what's on the screen? Okay, great. Just want to make sure. Thanks for everyone for coming tonight, I really appreciate the mayor for making it possible. We had a really good conversation and meeting. Uh, when I saw the tax bills come out, I was upset. Uh, and I'll show you why. Because we have, we don't determine your tax bill. Um, we determine your assessments, which is your share of the overall burden. So I don't determine the size of the burden, but the assessor's office and the board review, they don't determine the size of the burden. Um, the size of the burden, which is the amount of, of dollars that fund your schools and your village and your parks and your library, those are determined by others. Assessments don't, do, don't determine that amount of money that has to be raised. And that also influences that discussion that we just heard about pensions. Assessments don't have anything to do with that. There's a certain amount of dollars that are raised in the community every year, regardless of what happens with assessments. Assessments are how that amount of money is divided up amongst all of the property owners in your community. Commercial, industrial, residential. And the standard we have in the state is to look at market values for all these things to decide this is your share of the total market value of property in the village and that determines your share of that amount of dollars, the levy that's supposed to be raised. So a lot of people think that as the assessor, I like property taxes. I don't. I actually think there are much better ways of funding our schools, which are two thirds of our property tax bill. Um, 
we're dead last in the United States here in Illinois for getting state support for funding our schools. Communities are on their own for paying for their education of their children. They have to do it through property taxes. I don't think that's right because as many of you know here, if you own businesses, there are some ways to generate income that don't involve any brick and mortar. And there are others that do. And it's the ones that invest in brick and mortar and provide local jobs that have to shoulder all of that burden. Whereas all the other parts of the economy that are just digital, they get a pass. And so I don't think that's right. So I'm not here to defend our property tax system. What I am here to do is two things. First of all, I wanna give you some actionable things that you can do to drive your own tax bill if you can. So that has to do with exemptions tonight. Um, the mayor was talking about senior exemptions that have been dropped from people's bill. We'll talk more about exemptions and what those can, what we can do here before your tax bills are due on October 1st. So we'll talk about that. Then I want to give you an explanation for why the bills went up in Broadview this year from the point of view of assessments. It's not the whole story. Uh, the school districts here did raise the levy this year. Voters decided to raise the levy so they could invest more in the education of your children. And that was a choice that people here made and that can be a good choice. So I'm not here to talk about that because I don't know how much was raised through the levy. But what I'm here to talk about is assessments, which is how that levy is divided up amongst all of us. And we're the first part of that process, but we're not the only part. There's another part that you need to understand that influences your share of that levy. And we'll talk about that part. Um, so uh, let me go to the next slide here. First of all, so that's what we're talking about here. Let's talk about exemptions. So this is what you can do that's actionable today. What's an exemption? An exemption is an amount you can take off of the top of your assessed value that reduces your bill. It provides you savings. Um, we can, if you, what you can do is check on your property tax bill if you have included all of the exemptions that are supposed to be there. Um, so the way we can do that is, first of all, here's a list of the exemptions. The homeowner's exemption is the most popular exemption. Only 70% of homeowners actually have the homeowner's exemption on it. 30% don't. So first of all, check your own bill. If you have a loved one or someone in your friendship circle, check their bills too. You can actually look on the Cook County Treasurer's site look up by address, see if your friends have their exemptions that they should. If they don't, you could be saving them money. Um, I'll show you if they haven't had an exemption before how you can also save them money. It's called a certificate of error. The second most popular exemption is the senior exemption. And for folks who are over 65 where it's their main residence, it's, it's an additional amount you can take off of your bill. It's for any senior um, that is over 65 regardless of their income if it's their main residence. The third important exemption is the senior freeze. This is a means tested exemption. So if you have a combined family income of under 65, a combined household income of under $65,000 after some adjustments, you can freeze your equalized assessed value um, so that in times like this, when assessments are growing, when housing prices are growing, your uh, equalized assessed value can be frozen in place. This is one of the most valuable exemptions that's created by the state. There are other exemptions uh, that we can talk about later that I have a little bit more documentary requirement to qualify. They're not as numerous. I'm going to skip over those. We can talk about them if you like. So the first thing we can do is check on your property tax bill for the exemption. So you see the part here in red, it's in the red square. That lists if you have exemptions on your bill. If you're seeing zeros there for the homeowner's exemption and for the senior citizen exemption and the senior freeze exemption, we can help you here today to make sure that we can reissue your bill with your senior exemptions on there and that will reduce your bill. So that's the most actionable thing we can do right now. And why wouldn't 
the exemption be on there. Now we secured passage of automatic renewal of the senior exemption in 2019. It kicked in last year, just in time before the pandemic hit. So it saved hundreds of thousands of seniors the trip of going to the assessor's office, exposing himself to virus or paper going around. So that was very good. P part of the passage of the automatic renewal, the senior exemption was that we do have to audit a small number of seniors. And if we thought um, some did not qualify, we sent them a notice saying, you must reapply under the law. Um, we got a little gold packet in there. So when, when we're seeing people's exemptions who dropped off, sometimes that can explain it and, and we can resolve it uh, right here. Similarly for the senior citizen and senior freeze exemptions, the senior freeze also renewed this year because of special legislation that we helped get passed in the General Assembly. Um, so that should be on there, but again, those, those annual audit requirements could cause it to come off. So right now, the actionable thing we can do is make sure that everyone's got their exemptions on their bill. Okay, now I'm gonna get, get to the explanation part of the presentation. So bear with me here. Again, I'm not trying to justify high bills to you. I'm gonna explain how they increased so much. This is a conversation that I had with Mayor Thompson and she said, I want everyone to hear this and understand this, Fritz, because no one else understands this. So I appreciate the opportunity. So first of all, here's the overall assessment in the south and west suburbs that we did last year that affect the bills that are paid this year. Residential values were up a lot. You can see there are two different parts of these charts. So it starts with the 2019 level that was certified. And then in the middle, you have what the assessor's office did. So that's our phase of setting the assessments that are in place. So uh, residential rose somewhat in the south suburbs, commercial rose more. Why? The assessments that we inherited from the previous assessor, from the Berrios administration, we found a lot of commercial assessments were undervalued in the past. And we've been, we've been investing in better data models to make sure that all assessments are reflecting the market values at the time that we measure them. And we're seeing commercial values rise accordingly faster than residential. What does that do? That reduces homeowners' share of the levy. So again, assessments are about share of the levy. Who pays what? Um, and we saw overall in the south suburbs and in the western suburbs, at our phase of setting the assessments, commercial was rising faster than residential, homeowner's share of the burden fell. However, you see in the second part, the yellow line going down again, that's the other part of the assessment system uh, that not a lot know about. That's the Cook County Board of Review. That is another venue for taking appeals. Uh, they take appeals and can reduce assessments, the same assessments that we raised. Um, and that, in this case, what you see, and this is often the case, they're making larger cuts to commercial than residential, so some of the burden goes back onto homeowners. These are numbers that we certify, so this is something that I'm okay to talk about. I can't speak as to why they do this. What I just can speak to is the fact that it happens. So the second chart is, you can see how share of the burden changed with those changes. And this is overall in the south and western suburbs. So you can see, you'll remember that yellow line rose that's because we raised commercial assessments more than residential. So in the south suburbs, it reduced homeowners share of the overall levy from 70% to 62%. And then with the yellow line coming back down from the cuts, uh, the board review, that tended to put more burden back on the homeowner. So residential burden rose from 62 to 68%. So in most of the south suburbs, in the end, residential homeowners did come out with less share of the burden, less than they would have through our phase of the assessment. But nonetheless, this reduced homeowner share of the burden. I'll show you a chart later for how that translated into lower bills in lots of the south suburbs, and but why it didn't happen here in Broadview. So here, the here you can see, so the charts being combined here for the county, this is all the county. 
Um, again, you can see the dynamics of we're raising commercial uh, homeowners share of the burden falls. Some of it is given back through reassessment at the board review through uh, revised commercial values at the board review. Okay, let's look at Broadview. And sorry, the last line here says Maywood, but it should say Broadview. Um, here you can see that we reduced homeowners' share of the burden in Broadview. This is the trend that happened in every other community of the south suburbs and the western suburbs as well. Commercial rose more in Broadview than residential did. So residential share of the burden fell from 36% to 33%. Okay. Um, and so uh, at our phase of the assessment would have reduced the burden borne by homeowners in Broadview by uh, three percentage points. Now we still increased residential assessments, but residential share of the overall assessed value fell at our phase. Um, now the board review took appeals on commercial properties um, and the, the commercial properties were cut so much that it not only reversed the share of the burden that homeowners were getting at our phase of the process, but uh, the cuts to commercial by the board review were so large that homeowners are now paying two percentage points more of the burden than they started out with. And um, I just want you to know that the assessor's office in our phase of the work, that is uh, not a number that would have obtained. So there's another process going on here that shifted homeowners share of the burden. I, you are welcome to ask them as to the logic underlying um, those changes. I'm gonna show a couple parcels here in Broadview that drove this. These are some of the biggest parcels where there was a change in value. Um, if we look at 1821 Gardner Road, uh, it entered 2019 with an assessed value of $430,000. Um, in our reassessment, it rose to $886,000. Um, the board review cut the value down to $300,000, which was below where it was in 2019. Um, and there was a reduction of $585,000 in assessed value. Um, second one um, is Seagardall Corporation. Um, it entered the year with an assessed value of $453,000 we increased the assessed value. And again, we just, we, this is by looking at the data that we have on what the market value of these properties are. We raised it to 951,000. It was cut at the board of review to uh, 496,000, a little bit higher than it started 2019. Um, Prugo Steel um, started the year at 718,000. Uh, we increased the assessment to uh, 1.2 million. Um, and it was cut down to 822. So this is why data is so important in the work that we try to do. We try to show how we get to our number. And when there's a disagreement, it's always good to look at, well, how did you come to a difference of opinion on this? And I think it's important for, for the residents of, of Broadview to, to say, to ask, well, if the board, if the assessor's office thought the value was this, but you guys are shifting the value to this, why, you know, how do you explain that? Because we have to pay more because of that. Um, and I want to show you a chart to see how this played out in the whole south and west suburbs, because there's a relationship between the change in homeowner's share of the burden and the average change in the tax bill. Um, I don't know if, can everyone see this? Okay, um, so on the bottom, what it does is show the change in homeowner's share of the burden through the whole cycle. So down on the left, the, the blue dots, those are communities where they retained more of uh, homeowners reducing their share of the burden through the assessment process. And it generally led to lower bills. Zoom in. Okay. Sometimes it's a way to zoom in. Yeah, okay. like right here. And okay. this box you sort of pan around oh, okay. like where you want to be. So okay. Yeah, we'll go up there. 
there might be another video. Okay, so now you can't see the, I'm gonna take it back here a little bit just because you can't see the axis. So I just wanna help people with the axis first. Um, how do I undo that? Yeah. Ah, there we go, okay. So what is showing on the left-hand side? That's the change in the, in the median residence property tax bill. So lower, the blue dots are ones where, or those are villages where the average property tax bill <laughs> fell. Okay, so Digsmore Park Forest, Harvey, Flossmore, Calumet Park, there are other villages that aren't named there. Okay, and that's largely because residents, residential had lower share of the burden through the whole process. Remember that chart where I showed you that homeowners here might be ended up with more, where there are a lot of communities where people end up with less. Okay. And I know this is complex, but that is the system we have. If I were creating the system, I would not create the system, but that is, that is the way this has worked out. And then on the top, these are the communities where tax bills rose the most. Maywood. It's really concentrated for Bison. I don't know why that is. Maywood, Bellwood, Hillside, Broadway. So, Right. And so, right. So here, I'll, if we could uh, show that axis again, the thing, the relationship, why these communities bills rose the most. If you look at the bottom, the ones to the right are the communities where homeowners ended up having more of the burden than the start of the process. Okay. So I'm going to take you back to this chart. In broad view, you can see it started at 36%. Through our work at the assessor's office, it went down to 33% in the first part of the reassessment. But because of the cuts at the board review level and appeals, it took homeowners beyond the 36% where it started to 38%. So there's a two percentage point change and the two percentage point change right here, oh, you can't see my pointer here, um, off to the right. So right down at the, if you look at the bottom of the square here, yep. So this part, the bottom shows communities where it rose from two to 4%. Maywood, homeowners ended up having five percentage points more of the burden. And that's why the bill went up so much in Maywood. In Bellwood, homeowners have 4% more of the burden, Broadview 2%. Um, and, and it's really driven by a lot of big parcels. Now, I never want to end with a lament. I want to end with what action can we take? The first thing is what we can do as homeowners and for our loved ones is make sure that you got all your exemptions on your bills. That's what we can be done now for the bills that are due October 1st. Second thing is uh, appeals will open at our office so we can check to see if your assessment was calculated correctly. The problem with that is that even if your assessment was calculated correctly, if there are other parts of the system that are under assessed, you may still be bearing more than you ought to bear, uh, at least under the data that we have. So I think the other thing that can be done is that you know, we're encouraging municipalities, taxing districts, schools to, to go to the board of review and you can say, hey, we think some of these properties are undervalued so that our homeowners um, aren't shouldering so much of that burden. Um, and then your taxing districts, what, what are taxing districts? They're your schools, they're your villages, they're your libraries. And you can actually work together. There are lots of suburbs where uh, school districts and communities, they work together to defray the costs of going uh, to say that they can, you can come up with your own appraisal, you can come, you know, hire the lawyer to 
make the case before the board review that some of these parcels are undervalued. And that's how your local taxing districts can fight for the, the taxpayers who have been bystanders and not been served by this, who are shouldering more of the burden, probably more than they should. We can support those efforts through data. We have lots of data. We've, we, are, we have helped other uh, villages and taxing districts to make these interventions to preserve uh, their full base, to make the case um, on, on, that some properties may be undervalued. Those are some of the actionable things that we can take here. Um, I'm happy to take your questions and to have a discussion um, and just know that I do not set your property tax bill. I will try to explain the system as best I can. What we, the instrument that we have at the assessor's office is assessments, which determine share of the burden. And I want you to know that we work really hard to get the best data we can so that everyone is paying their fair share and there are no, there are no uh, properties that are under the radar you're putting more burden on everyone else. So, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. What the review for hearings? When do you have that? Uh, so the board of review is a separate elected body. Right. They do their hearings after we have done our uh, assessment. So uh, we'll be opening up for appeals in proviso in the next month. Um, once that is complete, then we will certify the values that we have, hand them off to the Board of Review, and then the Board of Review should open for their own hearings. So it will be uh, probably in 2022 that they do this. And they're, they're a separate body, which I don't control, and I don't, I don't claim to speak for them. I just I have to certify the values that they give us so I do have a larger perspective of it. Yes, sir. On exemptions, now, like, like long time, right? Now, they have 10 years to have a long-term exemption. Now, do for us what I have on my, looking at my tax bill here. I'm saying, why, I've been here for 25 years, and all of a sudden I thought that automatically would kick in after 10 years and it hasn't so i'm like why is it not on my tax bill every year yep and i went i went down to that nobody can give me an answer on that yes so i will give you an answer on that um so the question was for folks who didn't hear it hey there's this long-term <coughs> homeowners exemption where you have to have been in place for 10 years and your income has to be a hundred thousand dollars but why am i not getting this um, and the answer is the state, they created the long-term homeowners exemption. They make it very difficult to qualify for. It's not just that you live there for more than 10 years. It's not just that your income has to be under 100,000, but you also have to be among the tippy top of people whose assessment increased the most to get it. So only about one or 2% of parcels in Cook County qualify. And if you do qualify, we send you a letter. We say, well, first of all, those people generally don't want to hear from us because their assessments increased a lot. But we do say that your assessment increased a lot. You were in the top couple percentage points. So you do automatically qualify for the long-term homeowners exemption if you can certify that you meet these other requirements. Okay. I, I do not get to make those rules. I implement the law that the, that the state passes. But there is your explanation. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am, in the back, in the, in the white and yellow. Mr. Assessor, first of all, thank you for being here. We appreciate you. I'm Kevin McGuire, the village clerk, and at the mayor's direction, I've worked with several residents and households in trying to get our senior exemptions and senior freezes. Um, one of the questions that the seniors are asking is, while we're waiting for this adjustment, should we pay our taxes or should we wait for the reduction in bill? And I don't want to advise them not to pay their taxes and possibly incur some type of uh, additional fee or penalty. So um, I'd like you to first answer that. How do we advise them or how should we 
uh, response to that question. If, if they have not received the corrected bill in the mail by October 1st, they should pay it so they don't incur any fees. And then um, uh, do we have, Scott or Kelwin, do you have any additional comment on that? If, if folks are getting a corrected bill in the mail, um, now I believe they could pay the corrected bill online, couldn't they? They could, um, but the, the corrected bill Thank you. Yeah, if you do know seniors that did not get auto renewed, please let us know tonight. Um, I can also give you my information. You can send me a spreadsheet of just PIN numbers, and we get that mailed out and corrected in 24 hours. You know, Fritz has really expedited the process. Our director of taxpayer service, he can fix that really fast, not just a senior exemption, but all exemptions. So if you didn't for whatever reason or you got sort of knocked off, it was supposed to auto renew. Um, you know, please let us know that quickly um, because we can just get that fixed uh, before October 1st and you will get mailed out a new bill. So I would just say, first of all, you know, don't wait. If you know people, tell us, tell us right away and we can get that fixed. But as Fritz says, we, we couldn't tell you not to pay that bill. Um, and if you did after the fact, uh, it was identified, it would be, uh, be a refund to you. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Second question, um, one of the residents asked me about the property classifications. And as I researched your website to try to get that information, um, this is not to put you on the spot, I'm gonna just give you this. Um, it kind of gave me a message that was misleading. So that's for you okay. to help Thank us you. in the future. Lastly, uh, a resident told me that they are a homeowner and can only take advantage of the homeowner's exemption for the home that they reside in. We know this to be true because they own other properties, whether they're rental income or other. So she was told that she can write into the lease that the tenant is responsible for paying the taxes. Could that tenant then take advantage of the homeowner's exemption um, in lieu of actually being the owner? I believe the answer is yes to that because uh, when you fill out the homeowner's exemption application form, um, you can. there's a box for checking out that this is um, uh, my <laughs> principal residence and I am responsible for paying property taxes on this uh, on this house. And so that, then that, that can be applied. Would the property tax bill then be mailed to that tenant as opposed to the actual yes. owner? Yes, it would be mailed okay. to the tenant because the tenant has to be responsible for the taxes. So I'd like to get some further particular information so that I can advise people that okay. ask that question from one of your yes. associates. And, and uh, we're, we're happy to do it. Kelvin might be able to help you. There's a form, an online form for the uh, homeowner's exemption, which has these boxes that you clearly have to make attestations to on that. Thank you very much. Yep. Yes, Good evening, uh, Mr. Assessor. And thank you so much from coming for coming to Broadview to spend some time with us on this critical subject. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. When I get my tax bill, does color make a difference? Like, uh, like yellow and blue or just blue and white? Does color make a difference when I get my tax bill? Oh, I don't know because I don't send out the tax bills. I think you should ask the treasurer. Oh, uh, my, my team that uh, does this might know the answer. Okay. Um, oh, Jose, Jose? Does, does color make a difference on the uh, the bill? You know, the, I think the blue color is the first installment and the yellow one is the second installment, which will show your exemption. Yes, the yellow one would show my assessed value. The blue one doesn't. The first installment doesn't give me any information at all. And so thank you for answering that. And then my and second um, question is, from, what, uh, from the demonstration that you showed us and uh, for the explanation as to why our property taxes increase so much here in Broadview, uh, it was based on parcels, you said, if I was understanding you correctly. And these parcels come from commercial property. So it, it, to me, I'm the kind of person, I'm, I'm a, a person that likes to, you know, um, help with equality and making sure that everything is balanced. And, but I know that's what your objective is as well. So I just feel like, you know, we are paying, we are absorbing the price for those large parcels. 
That's am I understanding that correctly? You you have understood that correctly. <laughs> okay, and um, there's a one question that I uh, last. This is my last question. Is it possible to be able to see um, other communities outside of proviso and how their taxes increase this all over, you know, Chicago, just say Illinois, because we're just Illinois here, right? Yes. So, uh, yeah, I would love to be able to see how other communities outside of Proviso and what their increases and everything is that is, is sure. can we get that information? So, from? Uh, so first of all, thank you for your wonderful question. Well, what and I these are, uh, these are, um, these not are, these communities, other communities other like communities. Evanston and yes. you know, all over, all over. Yes, Illinois. now what you'll have to do is you, it's, you'll kind of have to do a two step because I made this chart myself. And so I had to do the two step too. So the, the first step is uh, use our tool, um, which um, we have a tool where you can look at the, uh, the change in the balance of assessed value in every community. Um, and so our, our team will send you a link so you can go to the part of our site where you can see the change in balance in each community, so each municipality in Cook County. So this chart that I have up here, we have a tool where you can see that for every single municipality in Cook County. So that's the first part of the two-step. Second part of the two-step is you need to go to the Cook County Treasurer's site. Um, and is there a... Uh, I mean, that's, Maria Pappas, that's Maria Pappas, and she has a, uh, on the website, there's like 20, 20 statistics, and you press the button for statistics, and it'll give you this long document with like 200 pages in it, but you can find out the median change in the residential tax bill in every single community in Cook County um, that way. It's... The, it's uh, I'm going to see if I can find the internet here. Is it in here maybe, or is that blocked? Ah, here we go. So I don't know if we're allowed to cruise the internet here, but I'm going to cruise, see what we got. Oh, and while the assessor is uh, stating that, trustee, when you said, uh, you know, you want to do a comparison throughout the entire state, oh, okay. this is specific okay. to Cook County. Okay. So okay. you can go to the other counties and do a comparison that way, but we're talking specifically to Cook County, okay? Uh, okay, sorry, I, I don't mean to, so the second thing is to go to the treasurer's website. Okay, great, so you go, you search for Cook County Treasurer. Oh, not connected, sorry about that. Okay, you'll go to the Cook County Treasurer's website and pick the box for statistics. Then it'll give you this report where you can see the change in every community's median tax bill in the north suburbs, in the city, in the south suburbs. Um, and, uh, um, and then you can put those two together and get a sense of, I think you'll see the same relationship. The communities where residential share of the, of the pie tended to fall, they tend to have lower tax bills and in communities where residential share of the pie tended to grow, they have larger tax bills. Yeah, I, it's just uh, such a huge increase. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it, when I say a huge increase, it's, it's huge for, it is huge. you know, this, uh, you know, for the people here in Broadview. And so it's, it's important that um, I have a good understanding of the system and how it works. And so I have to, I, I'm, standing in you know in the gap for the people and i i really want to be able to understand it myself so that i can explain it to them and give them the right information bless you um so uh so this website uh uh the papas website is the website that i need to hit and look for the yeah, for the medium change in the property taxes for all over cook county yep yeah, yeah, and you can look in uh, in the individual municipalities you can look by township she has a lot of good data in there. I'm using it a lot. Because it's important. I just can't imagine, you know, these is residential we're talking about now. But, you know, when you look at commercial and how much 
money a business would bring in versus, you know, someone's fixed income. You know, it's just such a, it just seems like to me there's an imbalance. And we are a very balanced community here. And we will, um, yeah, I will it's right, be. It's right here in the slogan, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, 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 and ma'am, um, you know, the reason why we have assessments is that it's not supposed to be about whether we like homeowners or businesses or industrial more. Yeah. The whole purpose in the assessments is to take like favoritism out of the process and just use the market values. That's the standard in the state for deciding everyone's share of the cost of the property tax costs of government. And so this is people look at me and they say, Fritz, why do you get so, why do you get so worked up about valuation? And I'm like, well, this is about equity. Yeah. This, there's nothing more about equity than assessments. And it's, and it's kind of dry language, sort of like we had with the, with the pension dudes. Um, but it's really important because it affects people's finances in a big way. It's not boring. It's very interesting because it, it's like we all have this self-interest. Interest. And it's like, well, Yes. And, you know, Mayor Thompson, she made some very good points that, um, you know, although the, the increase has been large over time, it's still, you know, you, you, you know, it's still not as dramatic as it would appear. But I agree the change this year is a quite a dramatic change. And I, um, I got really upset when I saw the bills come out. And because I knew all that we had worked on our part to, to make sure we we're using better data to make sure that the system was more fair for everyone. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Mr. Assessor, just an attestment to what we've been able to accomplish with your office. Um, a real quick success story. Uh, Mr. Kruger here, who came to see us last week with his high tax bill, got results from your office already and cut his tax bill in half. All right. So I'm, I'm proud of what we're doing. I'm proud of your okay. office. Assisting right. us, so thank you. It's a little palliative for something that's pretty. I have, I have a question for you. Before you showed some pamphlets up on the board, yep. do you, did you bring some pamphlets that you could leave here for uh, our residents? Do, do we have pamphlets here on the exemptions? I don't believe we have the, the pamphlets. If you go to cookcountyassessor.com, okay. I have all of information. Yeah, we'll see if we can get some here for the residents. So before we uh, wrap up, if we can get the pamphlets where we can live in the lobby for residents to have access, I just want some clarity on the comment that the clerk had made as it relates to if you attended and you have a renter, you could put the information into a lease. What if I have a tenant, but the, uh, the taxes is escrowed through my mortgage? Do I still qualify for the exemption? I think that needs to be clear because... Yes, in, in, in that case... You, you wouldn't because you're you are through the escrow you are responsible as the person who has the mortgage debt for the taxes so you could not check that box on the form okay thank you for that point of clarity i just okay. wanted to be clear because when i heard that i'm like okay i need to do something yeah. different yeah. yes yes all right thank you mr assessor can is I, that can it i hit for him for a couple questions oh oh here we go I just wanted to know if we needed extra time to pay our bill, are you willing to give us time, um, like you know, without being penalized? Um, so you should you need to ask the treasurer that because she's the one who collects the bills. The assessor's office doesn't collect the bills. Now the deadline was already moved back. Normally it would be August first. Um, they didn't send them out later. So I suggest. Call the treasurer's office. I'm not sure what sort of leeway they have on this, um, but they they can tell they can answer that question for you. So I what I'll do is answer. I'll I'll take the lead and I'll call myself, okay. and then but, I'll report back to the community on the answer that I receive from uh, the treasurer's office. We will take the lead on that. Yeah. Please come back some more. <laughs> I, I I love coming here. I, I because um, I, got, I, I got spoke. One. The first time I was here with the mayor, uh, we were talking about industrial development and how we assess industrial properties. This was before the pandemic, just before the pandemic. Um, and I had a great meeting with your mayor who was like, I just sit, sit down with me and explain this for me, break it down for me. 
And then what I did, she said, I want you to tell my constituents about this. So I really appreciate the opportunity. We are happy to come back. I'm your neighbor. I live out in the West Suburbs too in Oak Park. So I'll come out anytime. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a couple extra questions for you if you got a minute. So I, one was just a follow up to for your discussion with the trustee. So we were kind of focusing on broad views, residents paying 38%, the business 62%. But doesn't that just have a lot to do with the fact, the makeup of your community? If you looked at LaGrange or Western Springs, the residents may be paying 80 or 90% because they don't have that business base. So what, what is a better factor to look at to do the comparisons? Well, you're right. Um, every community has a very different property tax base. Right. Um, some communities have, they're almost completely dominated by residential. If you look, if so, this this part of our site where we have the municipal or the township level uh, share of the burden, the, those pie charts mm -hmm. I was showing. If you look at River Forest, it's oh, like 90% yeah. residential yeah. and just 10% uh, commercial. And if you talk to the village leaders in River Forest, they're like, we need more commercial here so that our, our, you know, our homeowners aren't absorbing all the burden themselves. On the other hand, they have high priced homes there, so their rates are not high. Mm -hmm. Other communities have a lot of industrial. If you look at Bedford Park, it's like 90% industrial, I think. Right. Um, it's a very small amount of residential. McCook is the same, because I think they got like a quarry there and a couple of industrial right. plants. Um, but, you know, they might want to change the balance differently. There's no right answer. But it, in general, it's better to have lots of property value across which to spread the cost of educating children and the other costs of providing local services. The communities that have it hardest, they have to pay all those costs of educating their children and they don't have any property value. There are a lot of South suburban communities mm -hmm. like that where housing prices fell 50% in the housing crisis and industrial plants left and all that did but, you know, the cost of educating their children did not go away. But all the base went up. So the rate doubled or tripled in some places. And that, that gets to the deepest inequity in our property tax system, which is that our state leaves school districts on their own to finance the education of their children. If the state was covering more, the property taxes wouldn't be so high. Like in Indiana, Counties have an income tax, and that helps fund their schools. Might be a good idea here, given that we got lots of stuff going on in the digital economy that doesn't have brick and mortar. And you, your community here, it, this balance is great because you have industrial that goes to its own drummer. It can thrive even in a time of pandemic. You got retail as well. And you got residential. Having a balance is good so that um, it doesn't get out of whack. All right. Well, I said you, I, I've got two other questions. I'll give you the softball first. Okay. Senior freeze is income based, right? Senior yes, it's, it's exemption is age based. So if you have the senior exemption, you're over 65, you just got it. Yep. Correct. If you're right, senior exempt, senior homestead exemption, 65 and older, and it's your principal residence, that's all you need. Right. And senior um, freeze, you got to make less freeze, than 65. You got to be household adjusted income under 65,000. Okay. Well, that was the easy one. So the last question I had, and this is because this is very geared towards the taxpayer, but as a, an elected official or village, uh, village official, you were showing the um, the assessments for three places, and one of them happens to be by my house, so mm -hmm. <laughs> Perlo. Um, so, is, is that the twenty five percent of what you think the value market value is? is it, well, you, yes. So, yeah. when we are assessing properties, we're the our analysts are always thinking in terms of market value, and then the county ordinance converts our market values into assessed values. If it's for industrial and commercial it converts to 25%. If it's residential or mixed use, it converts to 10%. Now, if they get an incentive, and I know Mayor Thompson mentioned this, if they're getting an incentive, a 6B, 7B, um, 
by the terms of those incentives in exchange for the undertakings that they take to get that incentive, their uh, assessment classification rate can be 10% rather than 25% for a period. Right. And, and, and the, real, the real decision that you need to make, this is kind of where my question is going, is, for example, Perlo, when it was going gangbusters, there were 20, 25 trucks a day on there. They had two dozen employees. For the last five years, I think they've got somebody in the office there. They're not even using the facility. Mm. How does that affect... I mean, is that what they use? Because basically, they have a big empty building there. They're not making any money off it. And of course, when they sell it, they're going to make money. But so does that go into the uh, decision on the, the board when they go back? And that's maybe that's why they lowered it back down from what you guys assess? I, I don't want to speak for the board's process. OK. Uh, because I, I want to stay on my side of the net and not go on their side of the net. Uh, but the way the system works is um, we're supposed to be estimating the market value to a buyer, a, a not a superhuman buyer, but like a normal buyer. What mm -hmm. could a normal buyer expect if they're buying a property for its value and use or the income that it can generate? So it's, you know, if you keep your property, if you're not using your property and it's not generating income, that doesn't mean the building's worthless. We want to think about what a buyer could reasonably expect to generate as a flow of income out of that uh, building. So that is the way our analysts would think about a right. building like Provo. Now it can be very complicated with some industrial buildings. They're a steel distributor, right? Mm -hmm. So Correct. it's uh, probably a warehouse that, that has metal cutting and metal bending equipment in it. They got a lot of, I don't know what all they got yeah. there. It's big, big um, building. So yeah. we're just valuing the real estate. So we, we kind of look at it like a warehouse. Right. Some manufacturing, is harder to do if you have a packaging plant or um, like a chemical plant or storage tanks that, you know, that that's a little bit harder. But we, again, we always try to think about what could a buyer reasonably expect to, to pay or generate from the property. And, and I know that we've had buildings in town that have sat empty for a while and the owners have gotten some kind of classification that lowered it. Uh, what, okay. what, what, what are those? Okay. This is, I love this topic. So when, uh, before we came into office, the, the previous policy of our office was if a property was vacant, you could get your assessment reduced. It's called vacancy relief. And if you were like 90% vacant or 100% vacant, you could get 90% vacancy relief, which would mean your assessment was literally cut 90%. Um, and that creates, first of all, that's not how the market works. Like right. you keep a property empty, doesn't mean its value in the market falls 90%, maybe it's 30%, maybe 20%. And it kind of creates a perverse incentive to keep stuff empty um, and have people stash property and wait for the land to appreciate in value while minimizing their tax burden. So we talked to many different neighborhood chambers of commerce, community, folks especially who are really aggrieved about this because it's typically the good faith business owner who's staying open, who doesn't get that uh, reduction, who's shouldering more of the burden while the foot traffic is falling because the neighboring stores are empty. And then the local community has to lean more on sales, uh, on property taxes instead of sales taxes. And it doesn't provide the employment and vitality that an open business should. So we changed our vacancy policy last year so that, um, Every commercial property of a certain type gets credit for the local vacancy rate, whether they're 100% open or not. And then if someone is claiming additional vacancy relief, they will get credit for a fraction of the additional amount of vacancy that they have temporarily. And that's, that's our policy now. Okay, so the 90% is, is kind of no longer. It's gone. It's gone. And off, offline, no one's I'll, missing I'll it too much. Where can we read more to find out the details of the minimum time, the limited time, yes. and the other fraction of the program? We, we, have, uh, we have an explainer on our site. Uh, is Where is the vacancy policy? It's under the appeals section. Yeah. So if you click on the appeals menu, it says assessment vacancy policy. Got it. Thank you. 
because then that really plays into your 6B analysis. Because yes. if there's a $200,000 property and it stays empty, Ooh. and you know, a 90, 90%, they're, they're going to pay you 20000 and that's uh -huh. going to move that burden to every, all the other taxpayers, not only the residents, but the other businesses. Oh, you, you just right. found another topic that I love even more than the last one. Okay. He gave me a card, <laughs> said, ask Thanks. me these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we saved the best for last. So um, Donna Miller is one of the Cook County commissioners. She's from the South Suburbs. And she is one of the people who's become really an expert on this. And she has been aggrieved by seeing in her communities companies getting incentives and then keeping their space empty. So they get the incentive and then they stash. And they're and they're they're not helping the neighborhood businesses and the and so on and so on. So she passed an ordinance with our support that said that if you are getting an incentive and that property stays empty two years, the municipality can re request that the incentive be withdrawn. And there if you, you go, go to our office to bring that, right. and we will be happy to help you out uh, to certify that. So, um, and, and, your best and, advice. and your Cook County Commissioner, Brandon Johnson, supported that too. Your best advice is keep them all full and don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> So I used to be an investor mm -hmm. and in Texas, you know, they have lots of oil drilling there and they have taxes on the oil leases, but they have a policy that I think is kind of smart. They're like, okay, you can lease out this land for oil drilling, but each year that you don't drill in that area, the tax goes up. <laughs> so drill or give it to someone else who will, mm -hmm. um, they say. Um, and I think that's a good policy on land um, and buildings it, because if someone out there is willing to pay the price in the market, that's how it should be assessed, whether you're keeping it vacant or not. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Well, we'd like to thank you for coming. We've already helped a couple of our residents here tonight, so that was great. Uh, thank you and your team for doing that. And uh, also, you get more pamphlets out. Okay. The rest of us. All right. We're loud and clear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda, the item three year to date financials. Who's going to take that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, great. Oh, that's great. Yeah, great. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. Oh, Oh, you got it. Nobody wants to hear you. No. <laughs> you want to go make somewhere? Uh, let's see who stays. Okay, uh, uh, um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I agree, uh, Tim, Mr. Tim Hicks. All right, so I'll go over the revenues uh, year to date through August. Uh, Tom's passing out uh, the, the sheets here. Oh, so, so for the current month of, of August, we had total revenues of $1.1 million, uh, bringing a total uh, year to date uh, $5.6 million. Uh, the year to date budget uh, is roughly uh, about uh, $5.5 million. So we are ahead of budget by uh, $66,000. Um, and as of, uh, as of August 31st, we've uh, collected about 33 
0.7% of the total budget uh, for the year. All right, let's see. So in the packet, uh, we have a, a look at each department. So we'll start with the executive department. So for the current month, the executive department had uh, expenses of $63,800 for the month, bringing their total year to date to $145,000 for, uh, <clears throat> for year to date through August. Um, the the budget, uh, year to day budget is about 214,000. Uh, and so the executive department has spent approximately 22.9% of their budget uh, through August. Uh, we'll move on to the village clerk. Village clerk had uh, $4,654 uh, of expenses for the month of August, bringing their year-to-date total to nine, a little over $9,000. Their year-to-date budget is about $15,000, uh, and the clerk has only spent about a little less than 20% of his budget. So to give you a point of reference, um, if we were flatlining the budget, we would expect that the departments would be about 25% of their, their budget um, through uh, through the end of August, right. clerk is doing excellent. <laughs> clerk is doing excellent. I hope right. the clerk is doing that. Good job, clerk. Yeah. All right. So if we look at uh, buildings, uh, boards, and commissions, uh, year to date spend of uh, twenty six hundred. <clears throat> Only about fifteen percent of their total budget has been spent year to date. Uh, we move the finance. Um, and so for the month, we had expenses of 58,000. For the year, um, there's $560,000 in expenses. Uh, and it's showing that the finance department is 347,000 over budget uh, for year to date through August. And if you look at the general liability insurance and workers comp, those are two payments that were made um, uh, out of the finance uh, department, but that will be allocated to all of the departments. So next month, uh, once we allocate that cost to all of the departments, uh, we'll see finances uh, budget uh, come down uh, drastically because it, that cost will be spread across all the departments. Uh, we move on to uh, the municipal buildings and grounds. Page six uh, <clears throat> for the month, a little over uh, $5,000 for the year, a little over $21,000. Uh, they're favorable to budget almost uh, by $4,500. Um, they're 27.6% uh, <clears throat> spent of their total budget for the year. Uh, we move on to uh, buildings. Uh, the total is uh, on page nine. No. no, on page seven, at the end of page seven. So buildings, uh, $66.9,000 uh, for the month, bringing their year-to-date total to $175,000. Uh, they're a, <clears throat> a little <clears throat> over uh, their year-to-date budget of about uh, $9.1,000. And they've spent year to date about 35% of their annual budget. All right. We'll go to the fire department. Their total budget, uh, their total spend for the month is uh, 318,000. Uh, year to date, they've spent about 1.2, almost 1.3 million dollars. Uh, they're favorable to their year to date uh, budget of uh, of almost 800,000. Uh, and the fire department has only spent about 20, a little over 20% of their full uh, year budget. All right, we go to police department, uh, <clears throat> page 11. Uh, <clears throat> police department has spent 403,000 uh, for the month, bringing their year-to-date total to a little over 1.7, a 
versus a year-to-date budget of about 2.2 million. Uh, they're favorable uh, to their year-to-date budget of 482,000, and they're spent about 26.1% of their total uh, budget for the year. Uh, lastly, we have Public Works. Uh, they spent 101,000 for the month, bringing their year-to-date total to 384,000 versus a year-to-date budget of 359,000. So they're slightly ahead of their uh, an annualized straight line budget of about 24,000, and they're spent about 35.6% uh, of their annual budget. So for all departments uh, for the month, the spending was about uh, a little over $1 million. Year to date, uh, the village has spent on, out of the general fund about 4.3 uh, versus a year to date budget of a 5. 3 million, uh, we're favorable to uh, a year to date budget, a straight line budget uh, of about almost 850,000. And we've uh, spent about 27% of the annual budget. So for the month, we had a net operating income of 135,000 uh, year to date. We are, uh, revenue is, a, is ahead of expenses by 1.2 million. Um, and we would expect uh, at this point, uh, the year-to-date budget to only be about, uh, if it was straight lined, about 226,000. Um, and we've, uh, so we, the, the year-to-date budget of uh, what the net operating income, uh, we are, we're ahead of that pace by 188%. So what this really tells everyone in the residence is that um, if you if you just take a look at our expenses versus where we would be if we just straight line the budget, um, is the, all the departments are, are very uh, in line with their budget uh, for the year uh, in that we're keeping our expenditures uh, in line with the revenues as we as we get them. Uh, a lot of departments. Um, you know, a lot of what we do is contractual, uh, but the things that we can control, we are controlling. Good, thank you. Yeah, yeah I'd like to throw a hands out. Congratulations to the department heads for keeping us in line mm -hmm. and uh, keeping the costs down and, and doing what you're doing and still running the department. So nice job. Trustee uh, Abraham? No comments. No comment, okay. Uh, next item. Status of the audit update. That would um, be, who's going to take that one? Yeah, I'll take that one as well. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we we really pressing uh, our auditors, Baker Tilly, uh, uh, to uh, get the fiscal uh, 20 audit uh, done. Uh, we reached out to them um, last week or, or since the last um uh, Finance committee meeting. Um, there's a lot of things that that they came back with that we are uh, doing on our end, um, and we anticipate that once um, that we get all of those things done and provide them the documentation and uh, schedule time for them to come into the village and do some of the testing that they need, um, that we should hopefully have uh, fiscal 20 wrapped up um, next month and go right into uh, fiscal 21's audit. Okay. Thanks, Director. Uh, any questions for the director? No. Okay, I don't have any either. Nice job. Uh, okay. Number five, American Rescue Plan. You will talk about that. Mayor? Yeah. You're on. All right, thank you. So we've been having discussions as it relates to the American Rescue Plan and how we're going to utilize our funding. So right now, the Village of Broadview is estimated to get $1,038,655 in um, funds from the state of Illinois. And so it's certain criteria that we have to follow that we could utilize these funds on. 
And so we've identified um, and through our department head meeting on yesterday on how we're gonna utilize the funds in the village of Broadview. So one um, is to provide services and programs to contain and mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And so we're gonna be using some of the funding to purchase pers uh, personal protective equipment for all departments within the village of Broadview. So additional masks, the department has got to uh, give us an outline of what that looks like for their respective departments so that we can make sure that our employees are safe. And now we do know that um, the state of Illinois has put a mandate in place for school personnel and um, fire personnel, EMS, fire, fire departments on what that looks like of those that's not vaccinated. So we are um, entertaining legal to come up with a policy for the village of Broadview as we know, many people still do not want to be vaccinated, but we can't put things in place where they have to get regular testing. So some of the money is going to go toward that for employees that do not want to be vaccinated, but they got to be, you know, protected in the space that we work in. And that's going to be a village wide policy, not just for a particular department. The other one is providing services to address behavior and healthcare needs exacerbated by the paramedics. So that's crisis intervention. And so we're going to utilize some of those dollars for crisis intervention. And so the fire department and the police department is going to come up with a plan on how we utilize the dollars for the crisis intervention. I know the police department have already started having conversations with me on things that they're looking at as it relates to training tools and those types of things for crisis intervention. But in the community that we live in, we recognize that mental health is uh, uh, at the forefront of our community. We want to make sure that our fire and police personnel is protected and we can you know, do some crises intervention so that we can address some of the behaviors that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. The next one is providing economic aid. And so we will be supporting some small businesses through like mini grants. And so I have instructed the finance team to come up with that scope of work of what's that's gonna look like so that a small business owner can apply for a small grant to give them some legs to do a little bit more. So whether it's a brick and mortar or a home-based business that uh, that qualify for it. But these are things that we're talking about right now. Uh, the next one is to invest in our water and sewer infrastructure. So maybe two years, I wanna say that the state of Illinois put another unfunded mandate on municipalities. And one of them is replacing lead service lines. And so we had to do a survey of the community of all of the homes and businesses that may have lead service lines. And so we've identified, we have the data that we had to send over to the uh, EPA. We sent that over there to them, but we have to come up with a strategic plan. So now some of this fund can be released to help us with these service lines. We don't quite know what that look like yet. So the uh, Public Works Department is working out to how we gonna prioritize how we change these service lines. So our first thought is that we will look at families that have children under six in the home because we know that lead impacts them as they get older. In daycare centers like home-based daycare centers and then our schools and what that look like. So we're looking at what that look like to replace a service line is about $4,000 per resident. So it's a bit.
have some time to plan to utilize this and get our hands to the, the point of recording that we're going to be doing a lot of this. This is just the plan that the department of and I have just talked about. We're going to put this plan together and then we're going to just have a board to get that lesson on. And then we're going to just talk about how to build out the, the plan and get this out there to extend the plan. But the first and foremost, we're going to be purchasing the PE equipment for the employees that work here and those that do not want to be back. I highly encourage that they are. But it's a personal choice that uh, we have to take every test. And so that's something else that's so comfortable to do as it is to the mandate. So we have to test it. So that's about it on the American plan. Does the uh, committee have any questions? Any questions for the mayor? None. No. No, oh, thank you, Mayor. And it, it just goes to show what we're doing here at the financial group and as a village board is looking for other means for uh, taking care of some of the things that we have to pay for. Uh, this money that you have in here frees up some other funds so we could, uh, you know, move on and, and, and get other things. So nice job. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, uh, can you just repeat the amount for the state? Of uh, uh, money we guess we get for uh, one million thirty five thousand Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Here, real quick, for those employees that didn't want to get vaccinated, they didn't want to get vaccinated, they have to be tested regularly. How often would they need to be tested? So, we're not here to discuss whether or not they should be tested because that's a legal discussion that we have to have. But we know that we are looking at policies of what's best for the good of the problem and the employees that work for the good of the problem. But when the policy is created, I will do it uh, and we'll get the recommendation from the administrator to come before the board to approve that policy. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you, Mayor. And the last item, this goes to uh, funding that we're getting, and the department heads are working on. Uh, we've got uh, Anthony from the fire department. Anthony Monks. He's going to talk a little bit about the uh, grant money that we've got. Not grant money, but money that we went into with the other divisions. Uh, the other fire departments that got some equipment. So, again, going outside the box. Helping the village save some money. Test, test. So I have a loud voice. You should be able to hear me no matter what. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to speak to you tonight. Uh, Chief Kenny is unable to make it. Uh, she asked me if I could come. Uh, this is always good news. So we've received money. Uh, there is a conglomerate of departments. So we're part of a larger division. And within that division, uh, they applied for uh, grant funding, which includes Franklin Park, Leiden, Bellwood, Broadview. Uh, and it was a regional grant. And this grant is for self-contained breathing apparatus. Uh, that's what we wear on our backs, allows us to go into fires and hazardous situations. Uh, our current equipment is aged back to about 2002. Uh, they're over the 15 year uh, expected life. Uh, they're currently not compliant with our uh, 2018 NFPA. So in a nutshell, that's the regulations to keep us safe. The company that uh, they're gonna go with uh, is MSA. They're very reputable. Uh, Bravi was awarded 134,000. Uh, and that's in full. So that's for the packs, the bottles, the masks, and then the additional safety features that they're going to provide us uh, with these new packs. They are used by all local departments. So when we go to events, incidents, uh, there's interconnectivity, right? So we can help each other, which is extremely important. Uh, the new units will all have the same emergency hookup. They are meeting NFPA regulations, state and federally. Uh, one thing that's going to help us out immensely is the voice amplifier. You have this mask on your face. It's really hard to communicate, um, especially through radio. So this is going to amplify your voice so we can uh, have better communications. 
Uh, it's got a buddy breather, which just allows us to connect to the guy next to us, and then we can share air if one of us is low. Uh, it's highly recommended that you maintain your equipment and you upgrade it. Um, our current equipment is outdated. It's discontinued. Uh, this grant is, is amazing. Uh, so, talking dollar and cents real quick. The grant uh, was $134,000 for Broadview. There is a 90-10 cost share. Uh, we did budget $150,000 uh, for this fiscal year for replacement. Of that 150, our obligation is going to be thirteen thousand four hundred sixty-five dollars. <laughs> so much thanks to Chief Kenny, um, and then special mention to Chief Brem uh, in Franklin Park, who kind of coordinated everything. It's always great when we as firemen can get safety, and you know, new stuff, um, but it costs money. This is a way that we get all that we need. If any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If um, So all I know is what our uh, local amount is. Looking at these departments, Franklin Park, uh, Bellwood, they are very similar to us, just with, you know, size. Um, and I'll just add into uh, this $134,000. Uh, that's 18 air packs, so it's the harness and the attachments. There's 36 bottles. There's 18 um, buddy breathers. There's 32 face pieces. And then there's some additional accessories. The newer units now have larger battery packs. There's uh, lights and sounds that will allow our rescuers to come find us should we get into trouble. But just looking at this, I would imagine each department roughly got about $150,000. Um, other than that, happy to answer any questions. And if you think of something after today, feel free to stop by or call us. Any questions? Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much. Test us. Uh, so what I know is that this was a regional grant. Uh, I, I don't know the specific level uh, of it. Yeah. Other than it's good money. <laughs> and what, and what, and it just shows that when communities are working together, you can get more money and get more equipment. Yes. And Thanks, uh, Chief and Tierney, um, excellent speaker on that part. Individually, we all have to do the same thing, but when you take the power of the group, right, we can get more. So uh, there's some good foresight in our leadership, and this is excellent for us to get. So thank you again. I want the community to know how big this grant was with the departments that participated and with Chief Kenny, you know, the partnerships and the relationships that she had with the other departments to make our fire department as safe as it possibly can be under her leadership. So the total amount was over $530,000. And we got a portion of that. And just think if we had not gotten a grant, we would have had to pay for this out of our general fund. So that allow us to put that money to our more capital projects, getting streets fixed, sidewalks, alleys, you know, the things that we need to get done. And so I just commend her leadership. She is a phenomenal chief. We have a great leader in the fire department that's getting the job done for all of us. So it, it don't go unrecognized. So I just wanna say thank you to Chief Kenny and all of the fire uh, personnel because under her leadership, they take the lead and they, they are just truly professionals in this space of fire service. So $530,000 for all of the municipalities, but we get a, a portion of that to cover all of the packs that we need for our, for our firefighters. So thank you, committee and trustee Terry. Okay, motion to adjourn. Can I get a motion? Yes, motion, motion to adjourn. Second. Meeting's over. Thanks, Anthony.